uh, my guest uh, is uh, Mr. Angus McGregor Miller, uh, General Manager, uh, Defense and Intelligence at Microsoft. Uh, and uh, Angus also was uh, commissioned into the British Army and he was part of uh, the NATO spearhead operations um, in Macedonia and Kosovo. And after retiring from the British Army, and um, was uh, concentrated on the IT market. Uh, is it right? That's right. Yes. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm sitting here in uh, Heidelberg in Germany, so we're still uh, uh, very much in, in the morning today. And I uh, thank you for the opportunity to, uh, uh, to chat with you. I'm glad that we can uh, see uh, each other uh, via Teams. Uh, uh, so in this uh, conversation, uh, we will be talking about technology in army and solutions uh, for special forces. Mm -hmm. uh, and at the beginning, I would like to ask, ask uh, about one thing, uh, Microsoft. Uh, cooperates with uh, uh, British, uh, Polish, uh, and American army also, and uh, for the military uh, to co cooperate with a commercial company. And there is uh, undoubtedly a need for trust. Uh, so, sir, what do you think? Uh, uh, why uh, did the military decided to cooperate uh, with you, uh, with uh, Microsoft, uh, with business? So. I think, you know, I, I would take the opportunity to say it, it's not just those three countries. So whether it's NATO or European Union countries, whether it's say, in the Indo-Pacific uh, region, uh, whether it's say, uh, Latin America, um, we're operating around the world and we're working, working in all aspects of government. So you talked about the Ministry um, of, of Defence, but it might be the Ministry of Interior, it might be um, other government um, agencies that, of course, all play a part to national security and defending the national interest. Um, secondly, a couple of decades ago, you were you're probably right to, to argue that defence was at the cutting edge of technology. So if something was being built that was really cool and new and technologically brilliant, then generally organizations like DARPA were behind it and it was coming out to the military and then making its way into the rest of the commercial business. That has turned around now. And so the paradigm that we now have is that within commercial business is where all the technology, uh, technological innovation or the vast majority of technological innovation is taking place. And therefore, governments and ministries, ministries of defence, see the need in order to access that innovation to work with commercial companies. And then clearly, they do it in a very particular way because ministries are different, governments are different, so we understand that. And over the 40 years that, that Microsoft has been operating, we've learned how to operate in this space. Uh, what kind of specific solutions and implementation? Um, you can say something more about this and uh, about um, uh, examples of these uh, technologies. Well, you mentioned at the beginning of the call, alone the, re, uh, the, way, uh, um, the fact that we're able to have this discussion using a technology that allows for a, a virtual interaction, that we can see one another, uh, that we can read each other's uh, uh, cues, that we're able to uh, develop a, um, a rapport. This modern workplace, this virtualization was for many people, including ministries of defense, including governments, not something that they were comfortable with. And the last 18 months, we've seen that explode. Um, Minister of Defence um, around the world, uh, I would reference the United States or uh, Australia directly, um, who have implemented this sort of software. Um, you have the National Health Service in the, uh, in the United Kingdom, uh, they're doing the, uh, the same thing. But it might sound a little arrogant, but there's not an area of, of the military IT spectrum that I don't think we're operating in. And that stretches all the way from space, um, intelligence, logistics, personnel, veteran affairs, healthcare. We have customers um, a, in the uh, Middle East and Africa who are using our retail solution in order to run the military stores um, a, on base. Um, we have simulation, we have virtualization, uh, we have data centers. So really, it doesn't matter where you're coming uh, coming at it with our partners and with our platforms. We're operating um, across the board today. 
Um, what do you think? Uh, what uh, this kind of principles and it's uh, Microsoft uh, to work with um, clients from the military sector and uh, uh, with army? Well, we've taken um, a decision that, that we will work with democratically elected governments around the world. Yep, that's that's sort of the uh, uh, the uh, the bottom line, and we won't withhold a, uh, um, a technology. Clearly, as a, an American company, we uh, operate within a series of, of regulations, uh, whether it's export control or whether it's the international trade in arms regulations, as all uh, manufacturers, all commercial entities uh, do in this space. So we work within that framework, if you will. That's uh, uh, um, the, the legal framework or the principles that are in place. Clearly, we ourselves set a very high standard as to um, the responsible use of IT, whether it is um, artificial intelligence or whether it's machine learning, so that they're not used for you know, something that we're not comfortable, uh, uh, comfortable with. I don't think anyone has a problem with the platform being used um, uh, by uh, um, police agencies around the world to go after um, a, a child, a, 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 a sorry, paedophiles, a child pornography. That's a good use of, of those technologies. So we, we, we take our responsibility serious, seriously. And then within the uh, defense itself, what we tend to do is the principle is a, a shared vision of an outcome. Um, coming in and, and selling IT for the sake of IT or for the sake of technology because it's the shiny new toy generally doesn't work very well. So it may not be a principle, but it's a uh, um, it's recognized that if we come in as partners and we're there for not just the short term, but for the long term. So the customers we're working with, we've been working with for decades now, then that is recognized. And then finally, um, although it's not a principle for um, a ministries of defense is very much a principle for government. It is no good if we come in and we are doing business and that's it. We have to do business locally. We might be a global company, but we have to operate locally. So that means we have our colleagues that are serving, uh, um, uh, in this case, the, the, the Polish market directly, but we also have partners that are there uh, because we want to ensure that the local um, uh, companies benefit as well. And in the defense space, that means the manufacturers, that means the integrators are operating with us and in conjunction with us. Those are some principles I think that, that, that seem to make sense to me. Um, what is the role of the technology companies, uh, not just Microsoft, but also another uh, generally in uh, today's uh, technological and uh, geopolitical go go situation uh, in the military sector? Um, and so you think is the end of the time of uh, uh, military self-sufficiency um, for the government, for the states? So if I can turn your, your question around, to a, uh, um, a, a Nicola, then I would actually say, you know, my service was in the 1980s, 1990s, uh, um, a, uh, uh, when I said we were not military self-sufficient then. I don't think any military has been self-sufficient um, uh, uh, for a long, long time. Even if you look at the uh, US military, you might argue that they are self-sufficient. They aren't. Their forward operating bases are in other national boundaries, and they have um, agreements with those countries uh, to have those a, a bases there. And there is a, a geopolitical angle to that. So the idea of self-sufficiency uh, doesn't, doesn't make sense to me. However, I would agree with you that IT, information technology, is critical to anything we do now. Um, a, if I go back to the comment I made about the, the police, we are talking about zeta bytes of information. It is taking one person one year to go through a single case file of, of, of data. And that might be the same for an intelligence um, officer um, a, doing his uh, a job uh, um, in, in the J2 space. If you apply technology to it, you can take that one man year and create one day because that's how good it is. You don't remove the person from the decision cycle. All you're doing is providing them not the zettabyte of information, but the 10, 20, 30 things that they need to concentrate on. So 
self-sufficiency, I, I, I don't agree, was ever there. We always relied on allies and partners, and we are one of those partners in the commercial uh, entity. And IT is the only way that we can uh, um, manage the, the overwhelming amount of data that, that we are creating either by weapon platforms or, uh, um, or, or by gathering information. Uh, I would like to ask about um, one contract. Uh, Microsoft uh, wins uh, US Army contract for augmented reality um, headsets. Uh, and uh, I think it's all, uh, for our next 10 years. Uh, and uh, could you say something more about this? Well, clearly there's an element of a, uh, um, a commercial incompetence uh, around the contract. So what I'm going to talk about is, is what is open um, a, and, and reported uh, within the press. But I'll give you my observation as well, because I've talked about partnership and the IVAS contract you're talking about is a clear um, a, uh, uh, um, example of that, uh, of that partnership. So you might ask um, a, or you might question, why is Microsoft in this market? Microsoft is not um, a, a purveyor of military equipment such as infrared sites um, a, uh, um, a, that, that they're replacing. What we do have, though, is we have a very strong simulation, um, a, a very strong virtual reality um, arm. And we were able to partner with the Department of Defense in this case and show them those, uh, those qualities, those, those uh, uh, factors. And they said, we like this. Now, that's all very well liking it, but how do you take it from a proof of concept into winning a contract and then delivering it? How you do that is you iterate directly with the end users, not with the IT department, not with the financial department, not with the legal department. They have to be involved because they all have a place uh, um, in, in the, the wide contract, the wider contract, but you have to do it with the end user. So Microsoft embedded itself um, with the uh, um, soldiers on the training uh, um, a, uh, exercises, learned from them, built something, came back, corrected it, brought it back, corrected six, seven, eight iterations. And we're doing that before there is an award of the contract. We're partnering before um, a, a, the contract award in order to get the best possible um, a result. And then we went in um, a, with uh, similar uh, uh, companies or with uh, um, other companies providing this sort of similar software, similar hardware. We went in as a partnership um, and a, we won. Now, the proof of the pudding is delivering that now. So we have won the contract. Um, we now have to deliver it and we have to then serve that contract over the next few years. But yeah, I love the IVAS a, a, a award and thank you for bringing it up because it shows this clear partnership with the end users and the focus on the mission outcome, not just on technology for technology's sake. Um, Poland is also investing in technologies for the military and uh, Microsoft uh, is building a data center in Poland. And uh, what do you think, what is your opinion, what does it mean uh, for the Ministry of National Defense and uh, especially for uh, the country's defense? Well, if I've argued that IT um, is critical for Ministry of Defense, for government agencies in the future, then of course, I believe that building a data center in Poland is a critical part of, of that national identity of the, uh, um, of the, of the national uh, security plan. If you're asking me um, a, what should they be doing with it, um, a, then I've got a couple of ideas um, like the Australian um, Ministry of Defense are doing. They could be lifting their SAP um, a, uh, that is living on an on-premise database somewhere and placing that into the cloud. Other countries around the world have no issue uh, with doing that whatsoever. It's you know standard practice. It is below the classification um, a level that allows you to be able to uh, to do it. And that's going to improve your readiness. It's going to improve the logistics, the personal. That might seem like relatively boring um, a stuff, but it's probably eighty percent of the uh, um, of the government work. And then there's probably some things that they can do that are um, innovative, um, a, that are new. Um, one of the uh, um, a, uh, uh, things that, that we are finding uh, gains traction is around open source intelligence gathering. So I came out of the, uh, the J2 world. So I'm comfortable in saying that around 80% of the intelligence work is done on open source intelligence. There's a sector of the intelligence gathering that is very much uh, high security, but a lot of it is open source. 
And that open source intelligence gathering, the, the aggregation of that data can all be done um, in the cloud day, uh, today. In fact, most of that information is out there. In, in various clouds. So those are sort of areas that you can innovate using that data center um, in, in Poland when it comes online. Uh, um, when I uh, talk with somebody for, uh, from Army, um, all the time I heard that uh, the biggest problem is lack of uh, people in Army. And technology is one thing, but people is another thing. And uh, what do you think, uh, what kind of uh, skills uh, should um, have a soldier uh, in the field of IT's world, in today's world? I, I, I love the a concept that uh, uh, um, the Singapore Armed Forces uh, were talking about a few years. Um, they actually wanted to link the recruits. Now, it's slightly different military. They still have um, a uh, recruitment. So every 18 year old uh, goes in and does national service. And so they know they're going to join the military. And it's slightly different. But they wanted to access the 16 year old, 17 year old recruits. And if they were playing games, whether it was a tank game or a fighter aircraft game, they wanted the recruits to be able to import their gaming profiles into the recruitment process so that they could see how the recruits would fare either in an F-16 jet or in a Leopard tank and then actually send them to the right agency, the right um, uh, um, arm a, um, along the way. That's maybe a radical um, a, a way of looking at it. But I think the if I just look at my own children, I'm 18 and uh, 20 years old, um, they are quite surprised when they arrive in university or they uh, go to work and they're confronted with IT that they don't recognize because it's 10, 20 years old. So I think the, the, the new recruits coming in um, are able to help us here. They are uh, um, a diligent, they understand this uh, technology, they're quick to learn it. So the emphasis is on us um, as, a, uh, as suppliers. Um, uh, the uh, ministries of defense as the uh, um, as the employers to provide that technology so it's seamless they use it in private life they use it as a, uh, a teenager they use it as a young soldier it's it, it's normal the other thing is and i learned this say very early on in, in the british military you train as you fight so there's no point in having a, a really good system but then only using it when you have to so I would always encourage a, uh, um, a customers to be using that software all of the time because it then becomes second nature, which sort of means that the processes have got to be um, a looked at. This is not just about IT, this is about culture. So if you've got young people coming in and they are a culture that accept um, IT, then we have to provide it to them. But that requires us to look at the processes that we've had in place for 50, 20, 30 years um, we've always done it because it's that way. We don't have to always do it that way. So we have to look at that process. And then on that training, there's another part to it, which is sort of at the other end of the scale. As you have people coming out of the military and people leave for all sorts of reasons, I left halfway through my career in order to start a career outside of the military. There are others. My brother went right the way through to the end of his career and retired and, and has gone straight into retirement. And so, you know, there are lots of people coming out. What do you do with those people? They are generally very well trained. They are generally um, a cognizant of the, the military space. And do we want to lose them or do we want to regain them and, and keep them in that, that military um, area? So in the US, we have something called the Systems and Software Academy. Um, we are it's a 17 week course. It's all online. Um, we train people that have never touched a computer to be a consultant. Um, in, in, in computing, and then they can go out. They don't all come to Microsoft. They, they go to many, many companies, um, a, and they serve the military as, a, uh, as commercial um, a, individuals. Some of them might go back into the military as a civilian to um, operate as a civil servant. That's being rolled out into Australia. We have the first 140 applicants in, in, in Australia. So we take very seriously this need to train people and as I said at the beginning of the interview, um, a, if we're working with the government, it's no good coming in and selling a piece of software and then walking away. We're there for the long term. We have to ensure that people can use that software as well. 
Uh, I heard that all the time is a uh, fight between uh, state and between business um, about uh, so, um, future soldiers. Uh, and uh, uh, you think that will uh, there always be uh, a military competition uh, between the state and the business um, about people uh, that they are the best in IT sword? Um, I'd, I'd be very disappointed if it was a competition. We are better than you than you are. Um, certainly, both parties or all the parties have their speciality. I would be very disappointed, for example, if you have a military that says, "I'm going to run this IT system because I know how to run IT systems." They do, but it's not their core job. I would argue their core job is to provide a service to the service arms in order to do their mission. Yeah, so they can concentrate on that, let somebody else run that core business for them because there is a, a value in that scale. Um, it might be around security, it might be around cost, it might be around those uh, uh, individuals who are trained to, uh, uh, to manage it. So there, as with everything, it's a balance. Yeah, um, no one person is, is, is right here um, and we just have to find that. And we can only find it when we get together, when we're talking about it, when we're identifying those opportunities. Um, how to combine uh, the sovereignty uh, of the country and um, use uh, new technologies, uh, how to help uh, implement cyber strategies uh, for state and uh, what kind of uh, role is to here for the technologies companies? So, again, it sort of goes back to this uh, um, idea of self-sufficiency. Um, yes, a nation is sovereign. And I've been in a, a NATO um, headquarters when a very large Ministry of Defence turned around and said, no, I'm not going to do that. That crosses my political red line. Um, a, and, you know, I'm, I'm going to disobey that order. So, you know, that happens and that's a sovereign decision, but let's not confuse sovereign decisions and the need to, to uh, the, the national interest with the opportunity um, offered by, in my case, IT at scale and, and, and data centers. No one is going to be self-sufficient. Nobody is going to operate on their own. So whether it is um, as a European defense agency or whether it's as a, um, a, 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 a Five Eyes uh, um, a coalition or whether it's a NATO coalition or a UN coalition, we're going to work together. Yeah. And so what we uh, ensure with our data centers is that either from a regulatory point of view, European regulatory view, personal data doesn't leave Europe, which is very important. You could say that's sovereign or whether it's about ensuring that data that I have, that I want to keep in my boundary is boxed, but that's a technological box that you have control over. It's not necessarily going to be um, a, uh, within that data center in, in, in the country. Those are how we address those, those nationality or those sovereign and indeed those cybersecurity issues. And I have uh, last questions. Um, what do you think? Uh, what is the most important technology uh, for next uh, decade, for next years, uh, for army? <laughs> oh dear, um, <laughs> there are so many to think of. Um, a, I've talked about data um, a, a, a great deal, so I should talk about something else. But honestly, I'm going to go back to data. Very boring. I, I, you know, I could talk about simulation. I could talk about space. Uh, I could talk about a, uh, um, a, uh, the ERPs. No, I'm going to go back to data. It all comes back to data. All of those, whether it's a simulation, um, a virtual uh, reality that you're running uh, for training, uh, um, a, whether it's command and control systems, uh, whether it's your ERP system, they're all generating data. Um, and it's how you support and manage that data, control that data, so that you get the insights out of the data that you want and that you can action um, a, uh, um, on. So I think how you manage that in a sensible way is, uh, is, is what's going to face, is going to be the major issue that we have to uh, manage over the next uh, five to ten years. Okay, thank you so much for the conversation. It was an honor for me, uh, and I hope uh, that we will see you again uh, soon. And have a nice day. Nicola, thank you very much, and I wish everyone watching a good day as well, and uh, uh, stay safe. Bye now. Bye-bye.